Ephesians chapter 5. <laughs> Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. The fornication and all uncleanliness and co or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you once were you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Please be seated. So in the interest of uh, time, I'm just going to say, refer <coughs> to the first four teachings. Thank you very much. <laughs> you guys stole all my stuff. No, I'm kidding. Um, as has been said before, and I think it's a good reminder, especially after lunch, that Ephesians is really neatly divided into two sections. I love what Scott said earlier, you know, regarding uh, verses one through three, which explains and describes the richness that we have in our relationship with Jesus and our relation and our reconciliation with God through the sacrifice of Jesus, and the strength that we find is the bride of Christ in, in unity. But it's difficult to live as a Ephesians 4, 5, 6 Christian without understanding Ephesians 1, 2, 3. Paul's pattern, of doc, Paul's pattern in his, his epistles is always doctrine followed by duty. It's doctrinal followed by practical. And that's where we are now. What we see here at this point is, you know, he's talking about the richness of God and who we are in the richness of God. Then he brings it down to unity in the body of Christ. But now he's saying, look. You can't have unity if you don't have personal, good, personal habits, good, godly, personal habits, because the unity of a body is only as strong as its members. So that's what Paul gets into in a great way here. But if you've not yet absorbed the wealth of your relationship with God, then chapters 4 and 5 and 6 become yet another point of guilt and perhaps condemnation because your behavior is just not standard. And that's our tendency is to jump into these chapters without recognizing the richness that we have in Christ. And so that all becomes a works game. You know, we try to behave. And then chapter 6 becomes nothing more than boys putting on a suit of armor and pretending. My, uh, my guys from Northern Kentucky have heard this before, but I think it's worth repeating that uh, several weeks ago, I was, I was at, uh, my, Denise and I were out with uh, our son and, and his family, including our four-year-old grandson, and uh, Jack was acting up, and, and so mom quickly corrected him, and he started fussing and crying. He said, well, I'm sad, and she said, well, you're sad because you're wrong, and he said, I don't want to be sad and wrong. I want to be happy and wrong. <laughs> Dude, you just described the endemic sin, you know. You have completely captured the philosophy of man. I want to be happy and wrong. Well, because we have understood how much God loves us and what he has done for us, 
then as we read into chapters four and then five and then eventually six, this isn't a this isn't a, a must do kind of thing. It becomes more of a barometer of our relationship with God. Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying here? I can look at these things and say, if I am out of whack here, if I'm out of place in the way that I'm conducting my own personal life, then my problem is more symptomatic, or my sin, I guess, is symptomatic of a greater problem, which is the depth of my relationship with God. Understand that? When we have an illness, we can either treat the symptom or we can treat the cause. Let's look at the cause. And so we go back to, as Scott said, chapters one, two, and three. And then from that, our behavior becomes very different because of our relationship with God. It's God's love towards us that, that is to become our measure for our behavior towards one another. And, and when we jump into chapter five, we use it for this manual for the best life, you know, the walking in love, walking in life, being the perfect example of marriage. But it will always be a life devoted to God as imitators of Christ. So our lives point back to him. Our lives, our conduct, our conduct is not for our own glory, it's for his. Our marriage is not for our own glory, it's for his. So we find out very quickly that what God requires us cannot be performed in our own strength, in our own flesh. That was pointed out before several times. Therefore, again, that therefore count, pushing back to whatever was, was preceded it, therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ has also loved us. So, so Paul concludes the, the thought from Ephesians 4, where he described how Christians should relate to one another. In those last two verses that, that Jeff um, covered, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgot, forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God. We can only imitate what we study, right? In my generation, you know, everybody was trying to imitate, I don't know, everything from Jimmy Cagney to Jimmy Stewart and you know, and, 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 you know, if you could get the perfect John Wayne down, then that was something. You know, I don't know who people would be to imitate today, you know, or try to mimic. But that's what this word is talking about, that, that when we're mimicking these things. So we are to make God our example and our model. And we can't content ourselves comparing ourselves amongst men or trying to imitate <laughs> men. We try to imitate God. We try to be imitators of God. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. As dear children. And so Paul, what he's saying here is that children are natural imitators, and so they do what they see their parents do. They see what, their adult, what other adults do. Sometimes that's frightening in our own kids, right? You know? I, there are things that, you know, before I came to know the Lord, our son was born, and, and there are things that he did at two and three and four years old that you kind of, you know, after you come to be saved, and he's still doing the stuff that you hope that you gave up, and you, all you can do is go, ha, 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 you know. We have to be imitators, just as our children are imitators of us. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us. As in all things, Jesus is our example. He loved us. He gave himself for us. We're just display that same kind of self-giving love. It says that he was an offering and a sacrifice. A sweet sacrifice, a sweet smelling sacrifice, pleasing to his father. And so we're also to offer up that sweet, pleasing sacrifice as we give ourselves in love to others. Can you, do you recognize that whenever we do that, whenever we walk in unity, whenever we give ourselves in love to others, you please the heart of God. You touch the very creator of all things by giving ourselves in love to one another. You know, we often think that we have to, to lay down our life in a dramatic way to show our love for others. But 
The Lord just, he wants us to do it on a regular basis in small ways. You know, we don't, it doesn't have to be the big grand gesture, the big dramatic act. Just be loving and kind. So in verses three through seven, there's a contrast here to walking in love, and, and he calls it conduct not fitting for the Christian. Now, we read through all of those, and I, and I don't think I need to tell you what these things are. I mean, I'm going to talk to you about a couple of them, but I, you all know these things. The question, again, is if there's any one of these things that you can say, that's really something that I have difficulty with, go back to chapters 1, 2, and 3. Don't try and struggle with this in the flesh. Don't try and defeat it. Let the Lord defeat it. You do the work, certainly, but let the Lord defeat it as you get closer and closer and closer to him. Let him be that, that consuming fire, that sanctifying fire in your life. He says, let it not even be named among you. And he groups together these ideas of sexual sin and impropriety. <clears throat> And, and none of these things are fitting for saints and should not even be named among God's people. You know, and he uses this comprehensive list of sexual sins. Now, let me boil down sexual sins for you. Everything outside of male, female, married sexual relations. Period. That even includes, if you're unmarried, bringing you and your girlfriend up to a a temperature, a boiling point. That's a sexual relation. <clears throat> but we've come to, to understand that everything is okay. You know, a lot of Christians these days think as long as it's not sexual intercourse, it's not, it's, yeah. we're technical virgins. It's not the case. None of these fitting things are fitting except male, female, married sexual relations. Everything outside of that is completely forbidden, completely not even to be named among you. He said, well, come on, man. I mean, think of the age that we live in. I mean, the stuff that's being poured into our homes on a daily basis. Who's in control of what's being poured into your homes? Well, I can't even watch football without something Coming on the commercial, maybe you stop watching football. There's plenty of other reasons to stop watching football, but I'm not <laughs> going to go there. Um, <clears throat> Ephesus, who Paul was writing to, in Corinth, where he had just come from before he was jailed, before he got to Jerusalem where he was jailed, were centers of worship. Ephesus was where Artemis was worshipped, and she and there were sexual prostitutes all over the place, male and female, at the temple. Every generation has its difficulty. Every generation has its struggles with these things. But we're really not different from any other generation when it comes to the same sins. This is timeless stuff. And so we can't say, well, yeah, it was different back then. No, it really wasn't. And we still have the same obligation. Let not even these things be named among you. The other thing I want to point out is coarse jesting. That's the idea of inappropriate or impure sexual humor. You know, locker room talk. That's not acceptable. We're going to find out a little bit, why, a little bit uh, later why and how that applies to our home life. Though all these things are approved of and encouraged in this world, none of them are acceptable for those who, set, who are set apart for and by the glory of God. It's not so you can become saints. It's because you are saints set apart. That includes desiring other women or making joke, making sex a joking matter. But he says, rather, a giving of thanks. So, on the positive side, the Christian is to give thanks for sex. Sex is not a dirty thing. It's a wonderful thing. We receive it thankfully as a gift. We enjoy sex, and sex in a way that, that glorifies God. Which means, by the way, we're not going to get to the rest of 
the chapter when it talks about men and women, marriages, you know, in the marriage. It's just, I, I would be shoving things down your throat and it just, I don't know if it would be necessarily worthwhile, but this all speaks to that though. Because God's purpose in giving sex is not primarily for the gratification of the individual, but it's for the bonding together of husband and wife in a one flesh relationship. Man and woman will become one and nothing shall tear them apart. And part of that bonding relationship is sex. Any other motive for sex is a perversion. <clears throat> it is a perversion and it shall not be named. Any other expression of sexuality is sin. Not because God wants us to wants to deprive us of some enjoyment, but because it works against his primary purpose, which is for us to glorify him in all things, including sex with our wives. Do you look at your wife that way? Wow. God has gifted me with you. And part of that is the closeness, the intimate closeness that we have together. I'm appreciating the fact that, you know, sometimes that part of the marriage goes away, the physical aspect goes away, but the intimacy should never go away. The intimacy of our relationship with our wives should never go away. And when it does, that's when we find ourselves perhaps wandering off. And maybe the intimacy of our relationship is not because of our wife, but because our relationship with God is not good. And so we find fault in her instead of wondering maybe that there's something that I don't need to be doing. So the consequence is that these people have no inheritance in God's kingdom. Pretty clear. No inheritance in God's kingdom. If God's kingdom is alive in them, then this transformation has occurred. You've become a citizen of the kingdom, and so you cannot rest in these habitual practices. You can't just excuse these things. Are they going to happen in our lives? Absolutely. We're not sinless. But the habitual practice of these things cannot ever be okay. So if you're guilty of any of these things, Paul states that God considers you an idolater. Someone who is setting a lesser God between themselves and the Lord. Sometimes even themselves as that lesser God. An idolater. So we often excuse or minimize the judgment that comes with these sins, allowing ourselves or others to tell us that it's okay. It's okay. We're all human. Well, the fact that we're human should tell us that we need to repent before God and go back to Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. It's certain that because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So if you are engaged in these things, I encourage you to consider that. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. So Paul assumes that Christians will, will not have their lives habitually marked by these sins. But we're not even to be occasionally be partakers with those who are. Because he says in, in verses 8 through 14 that you were once darkness. So as he's, con he's condemning those who practiced these things, he also recognizes that this is the exact darkness these Christians had emerged from. Certainly the ones he was talking about in Ephesus, certainly me, I was that, that, I was that guy that came out, of that, came out of the darkness. But he didn't say you didn't come out of the darkness. He said you were once darkness. You were part of the darkness. And so he's, he says, anybody who practices these things, you know, sons of disobedience, <laughs> but now, having been enlightened, we're to walk as children of the light. We are children of light. So we're to live like children of light. See, whenever you're in the dark, whenever you're in the dark, it's difficult. You stumble around, right? You can't see the things that are before you, and so... You're banging into things, you're stumbling over things, you're stepping on things. But when you're the darkness, that means you're also casting that same darkness over other people and causing them to stumble. So that's part of the problem. But see, now you are children of light, so you should be 
as, as Jesus said, you are salt, you are light, not you will be or you should be. He said, you are salt, you are light. And so that way, because of the light of Christ, we are shedding that light. And so others can see these things in front of them. And we certainly can see these things in front of us. <clears throat> And this was mentioned in, in chapter 4, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. That's the light. So in contrast to being darkness and being the subject of God's wrath is the fruit of the Spirit. Now we know that's more fully described in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But goodness and righteousness and truth should mark us because we have the Holy Spirit in our life. And because we are Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 Christians and we re recognize the richness of God and we are filled with the Spirit, that's when we can say, I can overcome these things in my life. And I want to overcome these things in my life because of how faithful God has been. Not only to, to redeem me, but then to fill me with his Spirit. But then he says, and have no fellowship the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So not only are we not to associate with ungodliness, we're supposed to expose those things. Not for the purpose of merely talking about them and chatting about how horrible things are. And, and granted, we have a tendency to do that. I know that I can slip into that fairly easy, just talk about how horrible things are. We do this for the purpose of educating ourselves so we can avoid them. Let's be careful to understand that we're to avoid the, the unfruitful works of darkness, but not the people who are in darkness. See, we're the light. We're supposed to shed the light. Well, we're shedding the light to one another. That's good. But we need to be shedding the light on those that are in darkness. But for those who consider themselves of Christ, but yet want in that darkness, we are to have nothing to do with them. Sorry, man, you call yourself a Christian, but yet you still, you still insist on sleeping with your girlfriend. You still insist on partying every Saturday night. You still insist on doing illegal dope. You still insist on, on doing things that are stumbling others. I, I can't, I can't hang with you. It seems harsh to us, but God gives it for a reason. All things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. Even things done in secret are going to be exposed by the light of God's searching judgment. All the more reason to avoid them. All the more reason to be with somebody who's going to pull you into those things. If you know that somebody in your life causes you to sin, you need to cut it off. Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. That was made specifically for anybody who's teaching after lunch. <laughs> Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. That was made specifically for anybody who's talking after lunch. Uh, uh, you guys are asleep, man. I can tell. Our participation in the light is shown by our resurrection of Jesus. In Ephesians 2 5, it was, it was stated that he made us alive together with Christ. So, what Paul was doing was probably, uh, it's, it's been stated, it was probably a worship chorus from the early church to illustrate this truth that he included it in his letter. Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. It's time for us to stop sleepwalking. It's time for us to engage, engage in the work that Christ has established for us. And certainly, as our salvation draws near, more so today than ever. And in verse 8, 15 through 18, he begins to talk about that when he says, see then that you walk circumspectly. This light was given to us so we should walk diligently with awareness, carefully, wisely, not as fools. And then it goes on to say, redeeming the time. Now, there were two words that are used in, in scripture and, and in, in the Greek for time. And, and one had the day of simply, you know, day, hour, etc. like we use time. But then the other had this definitive portion of time, a 
time where something could happen, a time where there is an event that is uh, is imminent. And it's that's the difference between when Paul or somebody says time and the time, the season, the time. And the idea here is the time. This is a season of opportunity that Christians have to redeem. You know, it, it, the, the same word is translated opportunity in Galatians 6.10. Time, opportunity. So he's, he isn't telling us to make the most of every minute, you know, carpe diem, make the most of every minute. Even though that, that's not bad advice, he's saying seize the opportunity for the glory of Jesus. It isn't to make the most of time, to make the most of the time that we're in, the season that we're in. And the idea of redeeming the time is that you buy up opportunities like a shrewd businessman. You make, you make the most of every opportunity for Jesus Christ. Every opportunity. Now, I need to be cautious here. But in the time that we're in right now, In Acts 22, Paul speaks of the fact that, you know, he's, he's just been jailed. No, excuse me, he's just been arrested, I should say. And the guy's about ready to beat him. I says, you might not want to do that, I'm a Roman. And what he was doing was he was seizing the opportunity. He was seizing the time because he was using his citizenship to do that. Just prior to that, when he was arrested, he said, do you mind if I speak to these people out here? And he's looking out and he's... He's seeing this crowd of, of, of um, Jews that he's just like so excited there in Jerusalem and, um, you know, right, right off of the, uh, the temple. Um, I can't remember the name of the, the, the tower that, that's there, but, um, you know, he, he's looking around and says, oh my gosh, oh, I wanted to speak to the Jews about Jesus all my life. And, and so he takes the opportunity, even though he's been arrested, he's seizing the opportunity. He's, he is redeeming the time. Citizens of the United States, there's a time here. There is a time. And if we want to continue to walk in the freedoms that we have in order to do the things that we're doing right now, then we need to seize the opportunity. We need to redeem and buy up every opportunity that you can to do what is necessary that we can continue to glorify Christ openly while it's still light. Because the days are evil. This is another reason why it's important to walk wisely. Jesus spoke of a time when many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. He says that in Matthew 24. Could you say that Today, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Is that happening today? Lawlessness will abound. The love of many will grow cold. Do you see that happening today? Many of those false prophets are not in the church. Many of them are. But many of those false prophets that Jesus is talking about is not necessarily in the church, but they have these huge, overpowering voices that shout the good knowledge of the Word of God and the direction of the Holy Spirit, and we get caught up in it. Redeem the time. Walk circumspectly. Walk in wisdom because the days are evil. Understand what the will of the Lord is. This is what real wisdom is. It is the contrast of being unwise. See, whenever we have a good knowledge of his word, whenever we will to be, we're willing to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, then we understand the good will of God. Verse 18, it says, do not be drunk with wine. In contrast with the conduct of, of the world, you know, being drunk with wine, partying all the time, must be filled with the Spirit. Because drunkenness is dissipation. You know, it's, it's a waste of resources that we could be submitting to Jesus. You know, but be filled with the Spirit. And by the way, while he's saying be drunk with wine, that's, you know, he's not being real specific Well, you can't drink wine. Um, Oh, that's my five-minute warning. Excuse me. Um, he's not saying just wine. What he's saying is don't 
be intoxicated with anything at all. It's dissipation, means it, it's a waste. It, it waters things down, but be filled with spirit. And Paul's grammar here clearly says be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. Constantly, you know, just being renewed with the Holy Spirit. You know, it's, it's often been said that being a spirit-filled Christian is a redundancy because you cannot be a non-spirit-filled Christian. You can't. So what this is referring to is being constantly refreshed, refilled with the spirit. It's not a one-time event. It's a constant filling. So we ask to be filled. We ask to receive this filling by faith. You know, and, and whenever we don't, we find this lethargy. We find this defeat in our life. And so we go back through this list of things that are in, in, in Ephesians 4 and Ephesians 5, and we go, oh, I go, oh my gosh, I'm failing. I'm failing. I'm failing. This, and it becomes a law, and it becomes a work. And so what do we need to do? Just like what Scott said, reset. Ephesians 1, 2, 3. God is so good. He's filled with his spirit. It also indicates two other important things. The first First, the verb, is, the verb is passive. means God is going to fill you with his spirit. It's not something that you have to call down. And second, it's an imperative. So this is not optional. We receive it by faith. The drunkenness brings, and, and any intoxication brings about lethargy. It often it brings about anger, often anger. It brings about bad judgment. Whereas the Holy Spirit brings life and the fruit of himself. So then in verses 19 and 20, instead of doing, you know, the, all those other things that we're not supposed to be doing, the, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And so when we're filled with the Spirit, we'll have that desire to worship God, to encourage others in their worship of God. And, and so whenever we have that relationship with the Spirit, then our worship comes naturally. It comes naturally. It comes out of us just because we are recognizing how good God is and how filled we are with his presence. And so we're naturally going to praise. We're going to rejoice. And so that takes me back another, to another thing that Scott says, Christians shouldn't be whiners. You know, has the Holy Spirit ever whined to you? Oh, my gosh, I hate my job. <laughs> Jesus gets to do all the cool stuff. If we are filled... <laughs> With the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see things differently. And I say that in full confession because I whine about my job a lot. He's working on me, I promise. He's working on me. So thanks for that conviction, Scott. Um, you know, a complaining heart and the Holy Spirit just don't go together. So it says, giving thanks always for all things to God. Ephesians 3.14, giving thanks to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This attitude of thanksgiving. There's so much to be thankful for when we commit it to our hearts, the truths that are laid out in Ephesians. And when we submit it to the Holy Spirit, we are going to be overwhelmed with thankfulness. In verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. That word submitting, it's not a direct translation, so please don't um, please don't take it that way. But you know, whenever we think of submission, what that means is we're all under one mission, which comes back to that idea of unity. But in order to submit to one another, to be in submission means that we're all we all have that same goal. And so if what I'm doing conflicts with that goal, then I need to submit to everybody else as we're moving forward. You, know, you, you can't have somebody in a, um, you know, in a in an army that decides to do their own thing. That'll get everybody killed. And so that's what submission means. So, and so we're submitting to one another in the fear of God. When we're filled with the Spirit. It shows that mutual submission to each other. And it's in the fear of God, not in the fear of men. Because our goal is the same. Again, unity can only be accomplished if we're all looking at the same goal. 
Warren Wearsby says, anyone who has served in the armed forces knows that rank has to do with order and authority, not with value or ability. So it has nothing to do with how good you are or how well you do or how talented you are. It has to do with how you humble yourself before God and say, in unity with all my brothers and sisters that you have called me together with, we have one goal. And that's to glorify you. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that there's no rank in the body of Christ. But it does mean that we walk humbly with each other and we submit to one another in love and in the fear of God. Paul repeats this idea all through the extended section speaking about submission. And that's what we're not going to cover, I think, but I think we get the idea. You know, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Children obey your parents in the Lord. Bond servants be obedient. It describes what our motive is for submitting to one another. We should admit that we should submit to one another, not as an individualistic way, but as the body of Christ. So how can you take this home? When you understand the first three chapters, like as it's said all, all day, when you understand the first three chapters, you will understand chapter five. If you don't, it's work. And not the good kind of work. It's a struggling, stressful, condemning work. When you understand the richness that we have in God, the continual filling of the Spirit, the respect for Jesus Christ, then what we, co what we cover here becomes a measure of the depth of our relationship with the Lord, not a law to be followed. Because we can't. These things are unnatural to us. To, to act this way is unnatural to us. Only when we're submitted in total abandon to God will we see that, wow, my life has changed. Now, you've heard the remainder of this chapter, and unfortunately, we don't have time here today to cover it. You've heard the remainder of this chapter from the pulpit, any Christian material covering marriage. I'm asking you, from what you've heard today, go home, read the rest of the chapter. Ask yourself, ask yourself, are you, are you watering your bride with the water of the word, meaning are you washing her? That doesn't mean you just say, okay, it's Tuesday morning. We're now going to read from here to here. When she comes to you with something, you say, okay, this is what the word of God says. Are you laying down your life for her? All those things are measures. And if you're not doing that, Go back to chapters 1, 2, and 3 and see how much God has laid down his life for you. See how much God has watered you with his word as his bride. Father, we want to thank you so much for your incredible love for us. And Lord, even as we look at what is laid out here, the things that we should not even consider, Lord, we know that we not only we considered these things, but you actually acted upon them. And for that, Lord, we ask forgiveness. And we ask forgiveness in the faith that that sin has already been paid for. But Lord, we just want to agree with you that is wrong. We do desire to repent of those things. But more importantly, Lord, if we can so easily engage in these things, we ask that you would draw us closer to you. That in your mercy, we might see more of you. So we might indeed rejoice and be freed from these sins. We thank you, Lord, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.